Good evening and welcome to Harvard Hillel and our speaker series. I first want to thank this evening our sponsor, Andrew Marks, class of 1973, for sponsoring this evening's program. Andrew, thank you so much for joining and for your support um, to all of you. Your support is crucial to making these programs possible. So please do consider making a donation, a contribution, uh, or sponsoring a program. Andrew, again, thank you so much. I also want to acknowledge, I think many of you have probably seen our announcement on Monday that we hired a brand new executive director who will be starting this summer, Rabbi Jason Rubenstein, who himself is a Harvard alum. Uh, Jason is, in my mind, the best person we could possibly have had for this position. Jason is brilliant. He is savvy, remarkably, or I'd say even unusually thoughtful um, and so, so kind. Uh, after he visited Harvard this week, everyone I spoke to walked away saying, wow, that man is such a mensch. And that's not the only requirement for the position. Jason is very skilled in many other areas, but certainly um, a piece of, um, of the role that I think is very important. And he will be a role model for our students. He will be an incredible boss to me. I'm very fortunate and the rest of our staff. And I know how eager uh, Jason is to take the helm of this institution and lead our entire community, which first and foremost consists of students, and of course, also faculty, administration, alumni, uh, and all of you who are joining us this evening. So we'll have opportunities to hear from and learn from Jason in the future, but I just uh, want to make sure everyone knows that we are really very blessed and very fortunate to have Jason taking the helm of Harvard Hillel this summer. Uh, this is a precarious time in uh, both the Jewish for the Jewish community at Harvard and more broadly in America and the world, and that really is the subject of tonight's uh, conversation. I'm pleased, honored, really, uh, to introduce our guest, Franklin Fower. He's a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he wrote April's cover story, The Golden Age of American Jews is Ending. He's also the author of The Last Politician Inside Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle for America's Future, and World Without Mind, the Ex Existential Threat of Big Tech. He was previously the editor of The New Republic and a staff writer at Slate, and New York Magazine. His other books include How Soccer Explains the World and Jewish Jocks, which won a National Jewish Book Award. Franklin, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a total privilege to be here. Thank you. Um, I want to let everyone know we will have time for your questions later on tonight. Mm -hmm. um, down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A icon. So you can click that, type in your question, do so by name so we know who you are. If we select your question towards the latter half of our program, we'll invite you to turn on your uh, audio and video. We'll make you a panelist, we'll promote you, and you can ask your question directly to Franklin. In order to do so, we need to know who you are, so please don't ask anonymously. And please only ask a question if you're willing to come on. If you have a comment for me, feel free to shoot me uh, an email. So Franklin, I, I want to begin um, by asking you, you know, how would you define the golden age of American Jewry? When did it begin? What are the key features that in your mind have made it the golden age? So in the early 1940s, as the United States was fighting the Nazis, there was still this incredible amount of anti-Semitism in the United States, that there was gang warfare that targeted Jews in New York City. Of course, in institutions, including Harvard, there were quotas that limited uh, the number of Jews who could attend. And in general, Jews existed kind of on the fringe of the elite, the but there was a Protestant monopoly that was preventing them from having full access. And so in the 1950s, because of everybody had seen the horrors of Auschwitz, because the Cold War was starting to refashion um, the way that America conceived of itself, um, you have this incredible uh, explosion of Jewish creativity that comes when Jews Jews gain admittance to the American elite. In in 1950, there was not a I think there was not a single Jewish professor at Yale. And by the end of the 1960s, 17 percent of the professoriate at elite universities was Jewish, which is an incredible change over a short period of time. And what distinguished this period of the Golden Age um, was that. Uh, Jews didn't have to accept the devil's bargain that had been the feature of the emancipated Jew in Europe and the United States, which was that assimilation, the cost of citizenship was assimilation. And so in America, you could actually be your Jewish self and you weren't just tolerated. There was this bear hug, it felt like for a period where the nation wrapped its arms around you. And so when I was in 
when I was uh, kind of a, a college age kid in the 1990s, um, I felt like anti-Semitism had completely disappeared from the face of the earth, except for its presence in very fringe places like the Nation of Islam or things that David Duke, the ex-Klansman said. But what I thought of primarily was that I was going to a university that was 30% Jewish. Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song was what people played on the FM radio. Dr. Ruth, Ruth, his booby who'd fought in the Haganah, was America's sex expert. There were Jewish Supreme Court justices. Uh, and then in 2000, you had a very observant Jew who felt 537 votes of becoming vice, short of becoming vice president. And nobody ever really questioned his identity as America. Everybody accepted him. There was not an ounce, really, of meaningful anti-Semitism that was directed at him. And you compare that to other golden ages in the history of Jewry, you'd have to say that's pretty much close to as golden as it ever got. And so what are kind of the signs in your mind that this is now declining? So <clears throat> I should say it took me a while to accept the fact that there was that this golden age was was in decline. And, you know, you, you to me, as I started to think about this subject and I'd been thinking about it before October 7th. Um, you're friends with my brother, my brother Josh, who is more observant than I am. And so he would he'd wear a yarmulke around Boston. And he was he told me uh, that there was a time I had a conversation with him a couple of years ago where uh, I was talking to him about anti-Semitism. And I said, you know, anti-Semitism, I know it's out there. It's extremely important. I see th th what happened in Pittsburgh. I see all these things that are happening. But anti-Semitism hasn't actually touched my life. And so he told me about how walking down the street of Brookline, um, a guy had come up behind him uh, muttering Trump, 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 as he was wearing a yarmulke walking down the street. He told me that his son. I, I know that. Friend, I know that guy I had the same interaction. No joke. Did, OK. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a small city, Boston, so I don't know. Um, uh, he told me about how his son's best friend, who is Hasidic's house, was torched and an, what, what police determined to be anti-Semitic arson. Uh, he told me about the mapping project, which I'd followed kind of distantly from afar, but how Jewish institutions in Boston, including nursery schools, NGOs, were identified by pro-Palestinian groups as being arms of the Israeli war machine, which felt menacing at the time. And so when I heard him describe all this to me, I thought I really needed to take this more seriously and investigate it and understand what exactly was happening. And then October 7th happened, and I, it became something that I was kind of dabbling with or looking at, I suddenly felt like an urgent topic for investigation. But what was important for me was to look at the long arc of recent American Jewish history and not just say that we woke up on October 8th and it was a different world. And I started to go back and it looked like if I was tracing a chronology in the nineties, there were professors who studied anti-Semitism who said that it was basically dead. And then when September 11th happened, the world started to change. We entered into this rolling series of crises, uh, you know, from September 11th to the Iraq war, to the financial crisis, uh, you know, down the line through the pandemic. And in each of these instances, there was a meaningful uptick in anti-Semitism because this is very classical. What happens when the world experiences things that are difficult to comprehend, uh, like, like a pandemic, when government, a government kind of suddenly shuts down society or this virus descends without a whole lot of warning, people begin to go searching about for somebody to blame. And the way that anti-Semitism works is that there are these narratives that exist within the recesses of the Western mind. And, you know, people may not even realize that they have this reservoir of narratives floating around there, they're so deeply embedded. But then when crisis happens, and when these events happen, suddenly Jews get cast as the villainous figure in those in those crises. And so that began to happen. And then of course, the election of Donald Trump did so much to uh, begin to unleash anti-Semitism because he, winky, he winked at all of these white supremacists. He published his last ad he ran in his campaign, showed the faces of Lloyd Blankfein, George Soros, and Janet Yellen and described them as globalists who were bleeding America dry. And then you have the, the very fine people on both sides. And the thing about anti-Semitism is we don't know if it ever actually 
fully receded or it just became a taboo. But the point is, is that once the taboo was ruptured, once these things that were verboten or no longer socially acceptable became acceptable, they started to come pouring out into discourse in all sorts of ways in which I think even a lot of Jews who are very sensitive to this became inoculated because or a nerd because there was so much of it in the ether. So, yeah, I'm curious, you're touching on this already here, but I think you stated explicitly in the article, and I want to quote, quote, where you write that though it shapeshifts over time, anti-Semitism returns to the same essential complaint, that Jews are cunning, bloodthirsty, and mad for power. Anti-Zionism often takes a similar form, the demonization, the unilateral casting of blame, and the fetishizing of Jewish villainy. So I'm curious, but you have... In some ways, you say that there's this like underlying essential anti-Semitism, but it manifests itself from the right, from the left. Uh, so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how it does that, and maybe also if there is this underlying um, similarity, essential anti-Semitism, does combating it need to take different responses when it manifests from different angles, or uh, is there kind of a a way to kind of get down to the root cause or, or the root anti-Semitism? and challenge that. Yeah. Um, so uh, when anti-Semitism on the right manifests itself today, the primary strain that it takes is in the form of great replacement theory, where Jews exist in this very interesting place in the hierarchy of white supremacy. And this is kind of shifted into increasingly mainstream parts of the right, where Jews are kind of neither white nor uh, uh, uh people of color. They are these kind of agents who exist in between who are able to act kind of pass within white society, but then are doing are seen as doing the bidding of black and brown people. And so you get George Soros being blamed for this invasion at the southern border. You see this in things that Elon Musk has talked about where uh, in others where Jews, uh, Jewish groups get blamed for unleashing what this invasion and this replicates something that's very classical within anti-Semitic narratives, which is the Jews are the agents of the destruction of white Christian civilization. And then on the left, it's a lot more, it's, it takes a very different sort of form. And increasingly, it's just so entirely, integrally tied up in these debates about Israel, which makes it very confusing and very hard for people to separate because there are there are very non-anti-Semitic ways to criticize the state of Israel. Much of it, much of Israeli politics consists of criticism of the state of Israel. Much of American Jewry is very critical of Israeli policy. And yet there is this strain of anti-Zionism that uh, reflects all of the tropes that you just described. And it 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 places blame entirely on the Jews. It alleges that Jews have, um, American Jews um, are manipulating American foreign policy. They're manipulating American universities. They are this cabal that's acting out of a sense of dual loyalty or loyalty to Israel over other forces. One of the classical elements of, of anti-Semitism is this notion that Jews are, are bloodthirsty and I think when you hear the word, at least when I hear the word Zionism frequently, it feels to me as if it's just a synonym for Jew, because all of these things that can't be said about Jews in American culture suddenly get attached to Zionism. And I think furthermore, I think it happens on a lot of college campuses. You have groups like Hillel, which you know may have some involvement with Israel, but they get, end up getting cut out of progressive spaces and progressive coalitions, or you see Jews who are generally very progressive and oftentimes very critical of Israel getting kicked out of these coalitions and spaces because they believe that Israel has a right to exist. Doesn't mean that they're settlers, you know, support occupation that they have, you know, a lot of times these are very progressive people who are extremely critical of the Netanyahu government but the mere fact of supporting the state of Israel makes them uh, an unwanted, excluded presence. So I have two follow-up questions on this, and maybe one, since you mentioned Hillel, and you talk about in the article also, where Hillel. Um, I think you, know, you write in your uh, your piece um, about this kind of 
blacklisting of some Hillel's. I forget which one you were specifically talking about. Um, if you want to remind us. Yeah, there was, uh, I talked about rice and there was, um, I can't remember the other example that I had in there, but rice was cut out because of the LGBT. Uh, and then I think I, there, there are definitely examples at Columbia that track that as well. Right. And so you're right. And I'm quoting, what made it so worrying is that Hillel's practical purpose is not to defend Israel, but to provide Shabbat dinners and a space for ritual and prayer. To condemn Hillel is to condemn Jewish religious life on campus. And I think that some Jews on the left would say that, you know, Hillel shouldn't focus on Israel. Um, you know, you mention in the article that some Hillels, and probably most, uh, you know, host Israel programming, um, send students to Israel, certainly Harvard Hillel does this. And I think you know, we're very proud. That's a feature of what we do. Um, but for Jewish students who are more progressive, who maybe are critical of Israel in some of the ways you've already discussed, or don't feel like it's a, an important part of their own Jewish life, for them, you know, maybe that's a certain kind of liability. And I'm curious, you know, how you would respond to a student who would make that claim. I mean, I think, uh, well, Hillel, for starters, I think is just very consistent with the the mainstream of American Judaism. So in 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 providing a home for most American Jewish students, they are simply reflecting the values of those students. And then I think that um, it makes me very. I understand the criticisms of the state of Israel, but when I listen to a lot of the criticisms of um, Israel as a society or the idea, the existence of Israel as a nation, um, that makes me very sad because I think that there is, there's so much for even somebody who hates the occupation, who hates the war in Gaza to connect with an Israeli society, not the least of which are many forces, intellectuals, uh, films, uh, you know, uh, individuals who uh, they could probably connect with over a lot of these shared beliefs. And um, the other thing that just strikes me about this is that um, is that there we have the, the the beauty of the two state solution, which has been the accepted uh, goal of both the Palestinian Authority and Israeli governments and American foreign policy, still feels to me like the most realistic solution for the conflict that Jews, the, the Jews of Tel Aviv are never going to pack up and leave and go to Brooklyn. And they have a right to be in Tel Aviv because they've lived there for, for decades. And they've established there's, there's, there is a, there is a Jewish civilization that exists there. There are communities that are deeply implanted there. And I just don't know you know, what the logic or the realistic scenario by which, or the moral scenario by which you would make those communities disappear. Um, I think that's helpful. And, and I, I think Israel obviously plays a very important um, part of this, um, but I also want to sort of return more to kind of the articles about the age, the golden age of American Jews. Um, I'm curious if there are some pieces that you discovered in your research that didn't make it into the article. It's a very long article, um, so I'm sure, you know, fairly comprehensive in many ways, but there must have been things that you had to cut, and was there any kind of angle that you didn't get a chance to feature in the piece that you think would be important for us to know? You know, the nature of magazine journalism is that it takes it takes months to produce something like this, and then um, because it appears in print, um, you we go through this very extensive process of editing and a fact checking and copy editing i spend on on a piece like this i spend two to three weeks fact checking it and so where we go back to every single person you know i go we go back to i go back to every single person who is quoted in the piece to make sure that i'm kind of broadly getting it right and then i have i had two fact checkers who were anal anal retentively going over everything it's funny you mentioned um Andy Marks had sponsored this event, and he I, I, he actually had been uh, my lawyer when I was editor of the New Republic. And then you also you send a piece like this through a pretty extensive, uh, a very great lawyer uh, through extensive uh, legal review. And in the course of doing all that, I couldn't actually remember what I had <laughs> cutting from the piece. That's my long winded way of responding to your. Answer. Okay, that's fair. Um... So um, 
I think. Can I just say one thing that was interesting about this, which experience, which uh, was really helpful to me just as, um, as a Jew, as much as a, as a journalist was that I, when I was done writing the piece, my editor came to me and he's like, well, what, on these questions, like what is anti-Semitism? What's the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? What do you actually believe about uh, the conflict? He said, you know, in order to gain readers trust, you have to spell all this out. And so in my head, something like the distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism was something that I had been working through, but it's kind of, it, it, sometimes it's a very scary thing to try to, delineate these types of distinctions because um you're there's so much there there you know whether we ex- acknowledge it or not there there is gray area there and I, and i i sometimes regret that uh organized jewish part of the organized jewish community isn't willing to acknowledge that there is gray area that there are there are people i'm sure within the harvard jewish community who um who have some sort of fundamental issue with the existence of the state of Israel, Israel and can imagine a binational state or some other solution, and they're not doing it out of any sort of anti-Semitic malice. They're doing it out of you know what they perceive to be the best, most humane impulse, and maybe even the most Jewish impulse. And so to call something and describe something like that as anti-Semitic feels like you're imputing motives and you're describing something, you're 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 squaring a circle for, um, for, for, you know, not productive, for, for unproductive reasons. So given that that's the case, you know, what sort of heuristic might you advise for someone to use in trying to distinguish between a criticism of Israel that you think is legitimate and one which is, goes beyond the pale? I mean, I, I think that we just have, you, it's very hard to discern somebody's motives, which is, which is true. And, I, and there's part of, debating where I don't like to impute somebody's motives that I'm debating with. And I'm kind of conscious of uh, the great rabbi, David Wolfe has written about the sacrament of debate. And so um, uh, I try to, I, I try, you know, I, I, in my best version of myself, I try to think that I can have a debate with somebody who I very vehemently disagree with. And that's the only way we can coexist in a democratic society. But when it comes to identifying anti-Semitism, we just we know what the telltale signs of it are, and we just we, you just listed them when you were reading from my article. The way in which Jewish villainy is put at the center of is center of the na- narrative, where the role of Jews in history gets overinflated beyond fact, where um, where Jews are accused of acting in uh, as as a nefarious cabal, and we could go on and on down that list. And when you look at a lot of anti-Zionism just as a practical matter, even though I can imagine many instances where anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitic, most of the time when you hear people invoke the word Zionist in the way that they invoke it, it seems to me to carry a lot of those tropes that indicate anti-Semitism. So given this decline as you've described it, what do you think of the implications for kind of life as Jews in America in the coming years? whether that's sort of broad strokes or kind of day-to-day existence? So a lot of my piece is about the way in which one of the things that enabled the golden age of American Jewry was that there were certain ideas that Jews played a role in championing and helped to develop. So one of these, it, it, and we can kind of broadly describe these ideas as liberalism. So there was cultural pluralism. There were ideas about tolerance. There were ideas about the universal protection of minority right, rights and civil liberties. Jews embraced those because they were good for America, but they were also good for, for Jews. And so as the golden age has gone into this period of of decline, what we see is that it's just a symptom of a democratic culture that has, and, and, and of institutions that have abandoned the liberalism that made the golden age possible. And so I think at the most base level, the thing that would most help American Jewry and most reverse this kind of climate, these clouds that now hang over us, is if we could restore democratic culture to the country if we could if we could if we could you know maybe dispense with some of the worst parts of liberalism that didn't actually work but but to save and 
preserve the the soul of liberalism as the guiding ethos of American uh, institutions and in, in, in of our and of our society. And what do you think would most be most effective in accomplishing that goal? Um, well, so I think at you know it, you, you could start with institutions and having institutions like like Harvard uh, uh, and students at places like Harvard you know, practice the idea that you can have disagreements over over policy disagreements over ideas without having to uh, destroy the person you're sitting across the table from. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's it's again it's like living living with living with a lot of the discomforts that democratic life demands the nature of democratic life is that uh nobody can get what they want all the time and it means sometimes you have to accept that you're on the losing side of arguments and you have to work to change institutions change society to win in the long run but uh you have to you know we have to accept certain democratic outcomes as as a as a society at, at whole as a whole and when you talk about college campuses and i think for many of us that's something that we paid a lot of attention to but a major feature in your piece is actually the experience of teens um mm. so because we could kind of highlight some of the key findings that you discovered in doing the research and also sort of how some of these problems are being addressed on the high school maybe even junior high school level right so I went to uh, the Bay Area, uh, and the reason I went to the Bay Area was I started seeing stuff on social media where uh, city council meetings would hold these debates over ceasefire resolutions. And then in the course of those debates, you would have people who'd come in who would deny that October 7th even happened. They would say it's a fabrication. These were kind of uh, lunatic conspiracy theories that seemed to be in relatively wide circulation out there. And then I uh, saw photos of a menorah that Chabad had on the shores of Lake Merritt that had been dismantled and hurled into the water and replaced by anti-Semitic graffiti. And so I started placing calls to uh, people in the Jewish community in the Bay Area. And they told me, yes, all this is true. But the thing that we're seeing that's most horrifying is the way in which this is trickling into schools. And so they described how um, teachers in the Bay Area were... Uh, using it as a matter of expressing their labor power to teach a, teach a very moralistic, one-sided view of the conflict in their classrooms. It, Jews stole land from Palestinians. Um, Palestinians are indigenous people. Jews are white colonial settlers, um, and which tracks with a lot of the broader um, uh, framework that students there have for understanding societal power dynamics. And when kids would hear this in class about how the Jews were bad people, they would then take it out on the Jews closest at hand, which were their peers. And what was so strange to me in this epidemic of bullying that I was seeing was that a lot of it took the form of um, callbacks to Nazism in one shape, way, shape, or form, despite the fact this was the very progressive Bay Area. But Really, the, the moment that just stuck with me the most and that was the saddest was I was talking to about 40 kids at a Jewish student union meeting in an East Bay high school. And uh, the one kid who was wearing a yarmulke that day pulled me aside and he said, you know, I can't tell you how much abuse I take because of this. When I walk down the halls, kids make noises of explosions at me. Kids shout free Palestine at me. That when I was going onto the 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 badminton court to play, they would say, "Here comes a Jew taking people's land again." They would throw pennies in his direction and tell him they'll tell him to pick them up. And saddest of all was that he didn't feel like there was an external authority that he could appeal to for help because he was worried that his teachers would were, were quietly judging him for being Jewish, thinking he was on the wrong side of history. And have you seen? What are some of the best responses you've seen to these issues? Because I know in the piece you really kind of focus on on the suffering that students are going through. But I, I don't know if I recall anything that really is talking about how these are being addressed or effectively addressed. Well, I mean, one thing that I saw that I found to be pretty inspiring was that 
you had a lot of parents who weren't terribly connected to the organized Jewish community who were spontaneously organizing, creating informal groups where they shared information, where they worked to organize, where they would show up in very hostile arenas. And uh, they would, I think, largely in the spirit that I was describing about of, of liberalism, trying to stand their ground and trying not to be not to be bullied out of their identity, not to let their communities be bullied into passing resolutions that you know, did, did nothing to mention the atrocities of October 7th. And so that was something that I found um, incredibly encouraging. And then I think the other thing that I've seen that gives me cause for optimism about, at least about the Jewish people, is that uh, at Hillel's across across the country, I kept hearing stories about how in the aftermath of October 7th and, and, and all the heat that's happened on campus, that there was an increase in attendance on these campuses. Uh, one kid at Columbia described to me how he'd been to Israel. He didn't grow up in a very, identifying in a very strong sort of way, but just kind of as an act of defiance in these days, he made it a point to wrap to fill in uh, in the presence of demonstrations as kind of as an act of defiance that even as the social pressures may rise to not identify as a Jew on campus, he was he was resolute about identifying as a Jew on campus. It's interesting to hear. I uh, want to remind our audience shortly, we're going to turn to your questions. Um, and you can type them in. We already have many coming in by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And uh, make sure you type your question in by name, not anonymously. And if we select it, we'll promote you in a few minutes to turn on your audio and video and ask your question directly. So Franklin, you talk in your piece a bit about how there have been other challenging moments for Jews in the United States. And I don't even mean going back, say, to the yeah. 1920s, but even more recently. Um, and you talk about kind of the this alliance that maybe had existed during the civil rights movement, which began to fracture perhaps even earlier than people uh, really uh, tend to remember. Um, but then you write the following. You say, among activists, the energy that had once been directed toward freedom rides was plowed into the cause of Soviet Jewry, which became a defining political obsession of many synagogues in the 1970s and 80s. Meanwhile, Jewish hippies turned inward, creating new spiritual movements centered on prayer and ritual. And I guess a question that I have for you is, I think Judaism has long flourished even when Jews themselves weren't in the best situations. And while the current situation might mean daily life for Jews becomes more challenging, potentially less safe, and certainly I'm not looking forward to the day when I walk outside and have to basically anticipate that I'll be yelled at or something for wearing my yarmulke or feel unsafe and have to wear a hat or something instead. Um, but at the same time, I'm curious uh, if you think there could be a moment here for a real kind of Jewish creativity. And I think actually just, I think of your family, right? Your mother, Esther, I think was the chair of the board at Sixth and I, an incredible institution in Washington, D.C., uh, Jewish cultural, intellectual, spiritual hub. Uh, your brother, Josh, I worked with him on Sukkah City. Uh, he founded Safaria, he co-founded, he co-founded Lair House, which is an incredible Jewish tavern and house of learning in Somerville, and now a Jewish production company, and your other brother, Jonathan, writing Jewish novels. And some of those things might be in some ways threatened. If Jews don't feel comfortable going to distinctly Jewish venues, maybe as anti-Semitism rises, those places will suffer in their attendance. But it seems to me that a lot of the Jewish vibrancy that, that I see can continue uh, into at least the near future, unless things really take a turn for the worse. So I'm curious, you know, there's a way in which Jews being part of the general elite uh, or having influence and power may be threatened, but there may also be an opportunity for Judaism to see a kind of revival. So what do you make of yeah. that? Uh, I'm pretty sure I agree with it. And, and just because this is going to, I hope this doesn't sound like a silly semantic distinction, but my piece was the end of, is the end of uh, the golden age of American Jews ending or the, the, maybe I said that not with a question mark, that was a statement, but I didn't say the end of uh, the golden age of American Judaism is ending. And those are two separate things, I think, as you're implying. And I think we actually do live in an age where there is a lot of innovation 
that's happening within American Judaism, where there are um, a lot of uh, there, there are new movements. There's there's constant churn. I think that you could you would say that there's um, there's kind of a sizably a sizable portion of American Jewry that maybe is more committed spiritually to to the religion than than ever before. I I don't know. I haven't seen data that, but that's what people say in response to my piece, and I'm willing to acknowledge that that might be the case. And I do think that if you look through American Jewish history as far as Jewish contributions to the culture go, the, the tension that emerges from having a society that's slightly at odds with you is actually generally something that's been uh, a source of productivity uh, that you do, you know, the, the explosion that happened at the end of the, at the beginning of the golden age came from that friction disappearing. But a lot of the subjects that the, that, Philip Roth or Saul Bellow or um, uh, some of the movies of that period, uh, some of the philosophers of that period we're dealing with were kind of hung hangovers of that period where anti-Semitism did exist, where American Jewish existence was on the margins, where it wasn't easy to secure your place in the elite, in the culture, that there was this real sense of struggle that fueled achievement. And maybe that disappeared over time as the community became comfortable and perhaps there is something productive, uh, perversely productive, I think we should say, by having a, a bit more tension in the relationship with society at large. Hmm, fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna ask, I think one final question, then we'll turn to our audience and you can continue to write in your questions. Again, just click the Q and A icon at the bottom to type in your question. Um, if for years I've heard friends on the left warn about anti-Semitism on the right and friends on the right warn about anti-Semitism on the left. And last year there was a program that I watched a, a conversation about anti-Semitism between two Harvard alumni, uh, Ben Shapiro went to the law school and yet your Rosenberg who writes for the Atlantic. Um, and pretty quickly, uh, I don't remember the opening remarks from Ben, but I know that yet year sort of pushed back a little bit and said, you know, in each of our camps, and, you know, Ben is more conservative, yet you're more mm -hmm. progressive, um, you know, rather than kind of pointing to the anti-Semitism in each other's camps, there's enough in each of our camps that we should be trying to address. And I guess I'm curious, um, from your perspective, given that we do see anti-Semitism rising on the right and on the left, uh, and so often this ends up pitting Jews against each other, because Jews who find themselves on the right tend to be, you know, criticizing Jews who are on the left for the anti-Semitism within their movement. Um, have you seen that change at all since October 7th? Is there more of a, a unifying front now against anti-Semitism in all its forms? Uh, regrettably, I'm not sure I've seen too many signs that we're willing to break free from our political lanes and embrace a more capacious understanding of Jewish peoplehood, which requires us to respond to anti-Semitism wherever we see it. And I think that there's possibly just, it relates a little bit to the question that you asked before, that if um, if there's an equivalent, if September 11th and October 7th kind of exist within the American mind and the global Jewish mind as kind of these traumatic moments, on September 12th, you had a lot of, of Americans who had rushed to enlist in the army or join the CIA or somehow find a way to participate. And that energy was bottled in the spirit of um, of, 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 of patriotism. And you have all of these October 8th Jews who feel, you know, a new sense of identity, a sense of their sense of trauma is propelling them to, you know, to connect with Jewish peoplehood in a fresh sort of way. And I don't sense that the, the organized community has done a lot to try to capture all that energy, all of that spirit to find a way to productively uh, channel that. And I think that uh, in response to crisis, I think the best thing you can do as a community is rally a popular front. And there's something so self-defeating about the way in which everybody entrenches in their political posi positions and can only see problems as they exist on the other side of the aisle. 
And, you know, part of that just has to do with the stakes of the next presidential election. But I think it would maybe more effectively help Jews navigate that to 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 to, to call anti-Semitism out where it exists. And, and, and furthermore, I think that as it relates to a lot of the internal American Jewish debates over Israel, I think that over the long run, Israel benefits from having um, a more capacious Zionism that doesn't identify liberal Zionist as a, an external threat to the Israeli state. And I think that if there was a way to uh, to expand the tent a little bit more, I think it would be in Israel's best interest over the long run by demonstrating that it's possible to have deep love for Israel while simultaneously rigorously criticizing its government. Yeah, I will say that I think um, you know, the work of a place like Hillel, which tries to be a broad tent and a pluralistic institution, uh, in my mind, even before October 7th, was becoming more and more crucial. And I was actually in Israel on October 7th, but also uh, about a week and a half before. And the mood there felt quite ominous and gloomy even before October 7th, just the divides that we were seeing within Israeli society. Um, people may be aware on Yom Kippur at Ne'ilah service, there was a, a program in the heart of Tel Aviv, and there was a whole fight that broke out there between people who were more orthodox and those more secular and spitting and um, and cursing in the midst of Ne'ila or at the conclusion to Yom Kippur. And I think um, there's a lot that we really need to continue to work on to make sure that we know how to be in a community that contains difference. Um, and and that to me is work that's always uh, important, but all the more so in the past few months. Yeah, it feels like it feels like sadly so much about the global Jewish community ends up replicating all these things, political trends that we see. Here in America, we see in other parts of the Western world where you have worldviews that just pull apart from one another and that treat the other side as an existential threat. And, you know, sometimes that is true. The other side does represent a genuine threat to institutions, but we have to find a way to walk back from the brink. Uh, we'll get to our uh, audience questions in just a moment, but I want to conclude, this is obviously a kind of uh, a dark piece and, and subject, but our incoming executive director wrote what I think was the best essay after October 7th. And I just want to quote something that he said, which I think is really quite beautiful. And he said, the tragedy we are encountering, we are encountering is that we are not the sole authors of the meaning of Jewishness. Those around us can contribute notes of fear, distance, and mistrust. And we can't control how they construe our Jewishness or what they project onto us. But the triumph of Jewish life is that the greater part of the meaning of Jewishness is what we make of it. No one can or will have more influence over our lives than we will. And I think it's challenging for us to be in a situation where we're not the sole authors of our identities and destinies, but also important to remember that we are still the primary authors of that uh, Franklin, thank you so much for answering uh, my question so thoughtfully. We're going to now turn to our audience Q&A. And if you're out there, you can continue to type in your questions now. But we are going to begin with uh, an international uh, crew, first with David Manzel as an alum and the father of uh, a current student and uh, former chair of our Harvard Hill Award, Isaac Manzel. But David, thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question is whether or not you think that the uh, gold, the decline of the golden age of, of Jews in North America is linked to the rise of DEI. And if yes, whether there is any way that, whether that sort of, what, what that implies for DEI, whether, you know, one would have to call for it to be you know, abolished or vanquished in some way, or whether there's some way in which the two can coexist. Thank you for that. Um, and that does, uh, it feels like a question that's on a lot of people's minds. And I think that there's, there's, there's a, uh, I was, I very self-consciously avoided in my article using the words woke or DEI, uh, because to be honest, sometimes I don't even know exactly what they mean and what we're talking about. And cause I think it varies sometimes from context to context. I mean, but broadly, of course, I know what you mean. And I think, um, 
I think there's a very specific problem as it relates to Jews, which is that the way in which the world gets carved up into oppressors and oppressed really does have very little place for any sort of understanding of anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is uh, not about oppression. It's an accusation of privilege. If you have a whole world, if you have a whole ideology that's set about trying to dismantle privilege, they're very, it will be very ill-equipped to understand uh, anti-Semitism when it, it occurs because anti-Semitism is the accusation that Jews have too much power and that they're somehow abusing their power nefariously. I think Jews in a lot of these DEI contexts uh, tend to break people's brains because all concepts about race um, uh, uh, and all these other social dynamics that are captured within a DEI framework um, uh, you know, emerge after the idea of the Jewish people. The Jewish people, uh, the concept of Jewish peoplehood is something that is independent of race. It's independent of um, all of these other taxonomies that that exist in the world. Um, you know, I don't know if we have to uh, throw out the entirety of <laughs> of DEI and and its noble aspirations, but I think as it relates to anti-Semitism. Um, and as it relates to Jews, I think that the that the it either needs to, it needs to be re reformed and reframed in a way that doesn't seem easy to do in the short term, but is um, uh, kind of of practical necessity in the short term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for joining. Uh, we're going to turn to Rossi Walter, who's an alum and. Uh, I believe may still be in Japan. At least that's where you were. Yeah. So it's great to see you as always. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm actually in the airport. <laughs> I'm in the airport right now. There's a lot going on. So I'm sorry. I'll try to keep the microphone close. Um, and thank you so much uh, for hosting this and for speaking. Um, so three, I think, I think you've spoken to a lot of um, what I want to ask about, but I think it, it's helpful for me at least and maybe other people too, to have kind of a, a uh, summary or some sort of uh, some sort of uh, some sort of summary of it and and so three pieces of context and three big questions nothing that I think is new to anyone listening but so the three pieces of context one given the growing tension with, I'm reading right given the growing tension within American society in general and on college campuses and how much of that is directed specifically at Jewish people including including Jewish Israelis two and given that uh, the Harvard, like the Ed School, et cetera, has begun hosting efforts to instruct and educate the Harvard community and the greater community on debate and dialogue of contentious topics, which was mentioned. And three, but acknowledging that, as you said, we don't know who we can trust, in a sense, paraphrasing. We don't know who we can trust as far as when menacing, bullying, and violence occurs, like even young students in school. So that's the context. And the three questions are, they're kind of related. So one, what are the options for the Jewish community and their so-called allies? Two, what are the goals as a community in this particular climate? You kind of touched on how Judaism can be distinct from uh, maybe Jewish people in this context. And three, where should we focus and what should we focus on, like internally within ourselves and externally towards and within the larger society? So what are the options for us? What are the goals and what should we focus on? at this time, given the larger yeah. context. Yeah, yeah. It's, those, are, those are exactly the questions. Um, uh, I don't know what time it is in Tokyo, um, but thank you. Uh, I think that the instinct to hunker down that we were describing earlier is totally justifiable, potentially productive in some sorts of spiritual ways. and. In terms of in terms of renewing Judaism itself, but I don't think it's a good strategy for the long run. I think that the the long hard slog of persuasion is, for me, basically the only course that we can pursue as a community that um, ensures a that we are you know we're 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 putting our money where our mouth is and that we are being advocates for liberal democracy. Um, and that I think it's also it's also good for the Jews because 
I think there's a lot that the world needs to understand about Israel and about the Jewish people that it doesn't understand now. And if we don't find the the arguments in the vocabulary that at least has a shot at penetrating, then we're hosed. And, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the delegitimization of Israel has been so extensive over you know, the course of the last couple of months, but really it's longer than that uh, because of the BDS movement. And I think that there needs to be a collective strategy for the relegitimization of Israel, that there is so much, there's so much about Israeli society, Israeli culture, the Israeli nation, Israeli people, that um, the world should be able to, you know, open-minded people in the world should be able to connect to. There's so much that's attractive about it that um and 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 um and dynamic about it and um that, that those compelling elements we need to find some sort of new way to to display those to the rest of the world that's really interesting it sounds like an opportunity um because you know this argument of delegitimization that's so used regarding the land um like the physical land um, it's interesting because some in many in many cases, I think that those same arguments could be extended to like the British Kingdom, the British Kingdom, so to speak, like the the wave of um, influence, let's call it, that it's had on the world. And so, if like this taking this opportunity to kind of re like crit criticize those arguments and also redirect attention away from those particular arguments regarding Israel's like legitimacy, so to speak, um, it could be an opportunity to turn the lens on other forms of, I guess, how to, not other forms of, but those same arguments that are being used, like trying to in a way test them or kind of prick at them by turning them and applying them to other areas of like larger, maybe global powers or larger, like the influence of nations on other nations in history, specifically regarding to like land, colonialism and things like that. So that also sounds like a really interesting opportunity, but thank you, yeah. So not turning inward too much, taking it as an opportunity, but not sitting in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for joining from so thank far you. away as always. Yeah. It's really good yeah, to see no, you. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm glad the timing worked. It's um, 10 o'clock here, almost 10 a.m. All right. I'm Safe still listening travels. to everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still listening to everyone. Uh, we're going to turn to Ruth Elon. Ruth is the mother of, uh, a, um, of Ari, who's a junior, I believe. And Ruth, it's great to see you. You should be able to turn on your audio also and ask your question. Hi, Franklin, thank you so much for the tone of optimism uh, on this very difficult and dark topic. <laughs> My PC is called The End of the Golden Age of American Jews is Ending. So, <laughs> but, you come, but you come across optimistic, and I thank you for that. Um, you. In the last part of your uh, presentation, you spoke to other times where mm. getting out of the ghetto exposed the, 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 the Jews and the educated Jews to their meeting with uh, the broader society and generated a flurry of creativity. And this might be another prelude to such a time. However, I, I note that at least among the more secular um, American Jews, they lack the foundational knowledge base for that. So the interaction necessarily will be different. In fact, I worry about kids. Um, you know, I, I really hear a lot from my own uh, boys that they just are not even ready for the debate. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I agree with you entirely, both about the broad failings of American Jewish education, um, which I think you're encapsulating in that description. And then I, as I go out and I talk about this, that's exactly what I find is that uh, I'll have a line of people come up to me and they're just like, what is the argument? You know, you know, I want the script. And I do think that um, that it should be an imperative for the, the 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 whole entirety of the American Jewish organized community to come up with those arguments in that script in a way that is tailored to fit college campuses, to tailor to fit the people who are going to have to use that script because they may not they may not believe you know everything that um, you know, the, the median Jew believes about Israel. And so I think, you know, that there's, there has to be an element of, of 
context and empathetic understanding as we hand those arguments off to people and disseminate those arguments to the people who who the kids who desperately in 20 somethings who feel like they desperately need them thank you thank you ruth and ruth is benji your son also yes yes uh, I, I i led a trip with him to israel and really a, a marvelous time and such an insightful young man can i and benji is now and benji's at mit now and he's reporting the same tools and problems there yeah. and on the one hand i'm i'm delighted at the uh what we call the hunkering down in the Jewish, and I'm Israeli, by the way, into the community, it's created a real bonding. But on the other hand, they it's it's a real opportunity to imbue them with content, with new content and new interest, um, you know, that could be deeper and run longer for the next Can seven I say years. one other thing, um, uh, Ruth, which is that so we see this hunkering down and we see this, but then the other thing that's happening and on a massive scale that is to the detriment of the community over the long run is that the number of Jews who say that there's a social cost to be paid for identifying as Jews is extremely high. Eitan Hirsch, political scientist at Tufts, just did uh, 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 a survey for the Jim Joseph Foundation. It's like 70% of Jews or higher on campuses say that there is a social cost to being Jewish. So that means that a lot of kids are just ignoring their Judaism altogether, hoping the world doesn't notice. And those are people who are gonna drift away unless there is there are these affirmative steps that we take to keep them, to hold them close. Yes, indeed, the, the, the positive content, yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. Thank Ruth, you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go to Bonnie Hausman for the final question of the evening. Bonnie, I believe, is a former president of Gann Academy, the uh, day school in Boston. Bonnie, thank you so much for joining. Oh, and uh, I didn't go ahead say and ask that. Your question. Uh, so my question is, uh, having go traveled around the country and you've heard so many stories of kids being harassed, what are their families saying? Are they gonna? Are their kids wanting to stick it out? If the children are young, do they want to keep their children in that environment? And have you heard people say that they would like to start other Jewish day schools in the community? And I raise this because uh, I'll say one other thing. In when, first of all. Our whole family loved your article. It was found by my daughter, who was a journalist, and she sent it around to the whole family. We've been discussing it for days. So um, what concerns me is that I there's a, there is one of our friends, I live in Newton, Massachusetts, went to a school to argue for advanced classes because algebra had been taken out. The only time in the whole school year that you could have an advanced class is in the senior year when you can take uh, the AP courses. And when the father stood up to argue that case, he was booed and he was called a racist. And the family withdrew their younger child. So we know of cases, I know of another case of uh, a family that decided just to go to a red state and get out of Massachusetts. And one child is now enrolled in the new uh, University of Austin. And the other one found another private school somewhere in Dallas. So we're hearing stories of some very unhappy parents, and I don't know whether you're hearing that. Maybe it's just, and so I think one of the things that I would take issue of that you said is um, that DEI is, uh, uh, you know, a workable situation. But once you really dissect what equity means, equity means you no longer teach algebra. You no longer give those students the opportunity. Yeah. And there was, as a matter of fact, I think I have it here. 
there was an article in the Wall Street Journal um, last week. Bonnie, I want to, since we're running low on time, I want to give Franklin a, an opportunity okay, to so, respond. Oh, so yes, sorry. But no, I just want to. Uh, no, but it's, uh, so, uh, excellent question. And in fact, <clears throat> as I reported in the piece, that there were these 30 families, and I know the number are rising in Oakland who've taken their kids out of Oakland public schools. I hear cases of this in other school districts in San Francisco and in Berkeley. I know that there are examples of this. And so, and when I was I was calling uh, Prisma, the uh, which yes, is I'm aware of it. I I worked at their at a predecessor organization here in Boston. And so it was too early for them to see where the data was going with this, but everything was tracking towards increased interest in enrolling in enrollment in in Jewish day schools. And I think that this is you know. And can I just uh, take it into the university context? One of the things that I think is really concerned to me about the atmosphere on campus is the fate of Jewish studies. And that I hear about how in a lot of these Ivy League universities, oh. you know, it's a basic study of medieval Jewish history, like, you know, it, it is, is something that it's almost impossible to teach in these sorts of places. And so I think that um, it's almost, a, it's also a matter of obligation, I think, to, for the community and for for people who are involved in academic communities to insist on uh, the preservation of classical Jewish history, Jewish studies, because there's so much about our civilization that not just Jewish students, but the entire world should want to, to understand because it's essential to our story. Well, Franklin, uh, it's after nine, so I want to pause here, but thank you so much for um, your thoughtfulness, both in writing the piece and courage in writing the piece and your diligence in writing the piece and also coming here this evening uh, and answering my questions and those of our audience. Um, you eclipsed even Justice Breyer in terms of the number of audience members. So clearly this is a, a topic that I think is really on people's minds um, and has a certain sense of urgency also. And in many ways, you know, here at Harvard Hill, we're here trying to address some of these issues with a brand new executive director coming in, um, who I think is someone who will, will lead our institution well in uh, in addressing these things. So, but I thank you so much for writing and for your time this evening. And uh, I thank you to your brother, Josh, also for making the initial connection. And thank you to everybody in your community who's asked such thoughtful connect questions. And I know even in our community where we agree about a lot of things, there are a lot of things that we don't always agree on. And I think to be able to have these discussions in the most thoughtful, engaged sort of way will make us a healthier community in the long run. I certainly agree. And I want to thank Andy Marks, also your former attorney, apparently, for sponsoring this event. Ask those of you out there. I went, please do I went, support I went, this I went, work. I went uh, several decades with him never getting sued. So I thank him. That's great. Our next program is going to be Wednesday at 4 p.m. with Tal Becker, who's an Israeli attorney, negotiator, a longtime advisor to the Israeli uh, foreign ministry. And he was also one of the attorneys representing Israel at the International Court of Justice in The Hague uh, just about a month ago. Uh, that program is off the record, which means it will not be recorded. Uh, it's 4 p.m., so we can accommodate Tal. Uh, it'll be already late in Israel his time. So many of you have already signed up, but you'll be getting another email about that event, and I hope you can join us. I want to wish everyone uh, a wonderful evening. And uh, Franklin, again, thank you so much for joining us, and a happy Purim coming up this Saturday night and Sunday. Thanks, man.